Morning. We uh, we have a wonderful children's music group called Sunday Sounds, and they actually uh, compose some music. And so we're going to begin our service today um, with this uh, piece that um, they composed. So let's listen.
Please remain standing as we affirm our faith in the triune God by saying together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the spirit. All of this is God's gift to us, offered without price. We present today for holy baptism, Henry David Hale. Beloved, in presenting this child for holy baptism, do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races, if you do say we do? And will you nurture this child in Christ's holy church, that by your teaching and example, he may be guided to accept God's grace for himself, to profess his faith openly, and to lead a Christian life, if you will, say, we will. Hi there. How you doing? You like that candle. You've been watching it the whole time. <laughs> and what name is given this child? Henry, Henry David. Henry David, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and pray God's blessings on you all the days of your life. Amen. <laughs> Henry David, this is your new Christian family. Our mothers, your fathers, your sisters, brothers in the faith. This is our new son. Welcome him into our family. I invite you to join me in the congregational vow printed in your bulletin. Beloved of the household of faith, I commend to your love and care this child whom we this day recognize as a member of the family of God. Will you endeavor so to live that he may grow in the knowledge and love of God the Father through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Oh, gracious and loving God, uh, we know that you've been with Henry since, well, since the moment you created him. And now that we, you have, you have, we have claimed him for this community of faith, marked him as belonging to you, we pray that you would continue to pour grace into his life. God, when he, we ask that you would draw him into a relationship of love with you that if he turns away, as all of us are prone to do, you would pursue him and with that same love draw him back to you again. And when, 
when he turns back, God, we thank you that you're a God who, who welcomes us with open and loving arms. Be with these parents, be with this extended family, and especially, God, be with us as a church family that we might live out our faith in front of him, that we might be that community that shapes him into knowing and believing what an amazing God you are, a forgiving God, and a life-transforming God. We pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Oh, very good. You can go this way. While our uh, baptism family returns to their seats, uh, this is my opportunity to welcome you to St. Luke's. Welcome. So glad that you're here worshiping with us. If you are online, we uh, welcome you. We see you as part of our congregation as well. If there's anything we can do for you, or uh, whether you're here or online, please reach out. We'd love to uh, connect with you. Um, if after the service today, if you're here in the sanctuary, please come out to the gathering room. It's just uh, down this main hallway, and we would love to um, have a little fellowship. There's some cookies with sprinkles on them, and um, a, great, a great time of just connecting. If I haven't had the chance to meet you, I would love to do so and uh, see if maybe there's a way we can serve you. Uh, please check in. Let us know you're here. You, St. Luke's has a wonderful app you can download. There's a card in your pew pocket that says uh, welcome. You can drop that in the offering plate later in the service. If you're online, there's a little tab that says check in. I have so many things I wish I could have time to tell you all about, um, but I hope you'll look at your bulletin. Um, as you know, our vision is of a city transformed by the love of Jesus. So we, we, uh, we have inside-out habits. So we will move inside out into the world. And uh, one of the ways we do that is, into, um, is in our, into our workplaces. So this year, we've begun this new emphasis called Working Faith, where we talk about how we leave from this place and we may spend 40, 50, 60 hours a week at work. How, how do we take our faith into that place? So uh, we've been having monthly breakfasts. We have a cohort that's meeting. This Wednesday at 8 o'clock, we have a breakfast. David Gao, who's the CEO of Gao Media, will be talking about, uh, he, I think he calls it a lifetime of lessons learned about how to take your faith into the workplace. And he'll be speaking and sharing with us. The breakfast is free. Just come and show up, or you can register. Um, I know you'll, you'll be blessed. Um, also, we have uh, next Sunday, uh, our parenting center has a, a, a presentation. So, we, so our parenting center works with both the, the children of our day school and the children of our children's ministry and tries to provide the tools that families need to, um, to, to uh, parent, to be good parents. It's not easy. I'm glad I'm not one anymore, actually, uh, or of children, that is. I'm still a parent. But uh, anyway, uh, Dr. Kim Swale will be here, and uh, she's one of our favorite speakers. And I know if you um, have, maybe you have um, your, your children or your grandchildren um, would, would appreciate that opportunity. Um, I did uh, also want to let you know that if you'd like to join St. Luke's, uh, this afternoon at 4 o'clock is our Coffee with the Pastor. I'd love to tell you about what it means to be a member here and uh, what that commitment's about. Um, what does it mean to, to sign on for the mission? What is our model for ministry and how you can be a part of it? Uh, so you can stop at the connection booth on your way, on, on your way out. Uh, we have a rotunda gallery where we display art. If you didn't know that, it's uh, just, just down this hallway and um, you can catch it. Uh, we have Marian, Marilyn Lowry with us. Uh, this month, and she is displaying in the Rotunda Gallery, and she'll be there after the service today if you'd like to go down and check out the artwork and visit with her. I think Marilyn may be worshiping with us this morning. Are you here somewhere? Somewhere maybe? I hear they're way in the back. There she is. We're glad you're with us. Thank you. One more thing I would like to lift up. Many of you have um, have shared that you've had in the sanctuary difficulty hearing, that there have been difficulties with the audio, um, that it sounds like an echo, or I'm in a dead spot, or um, it works with some mics and not others. And um, here's what I want to tell you. We hear you. <laughs> um, uh, and we understand that, how frustrating that can be. And we recognize it. We've been working on it. Um, sort of all hands on deck. We have a really wonderful media team identifying all the issues and how we can resolve them. It may mean some new technology. 
uh, to fill some dead spots. We just have, uh, we, it's, we recognize how important it is. And I want you to know that we're not ignoring it. We're uh, still working at it. I hope it may be better today. Um, I've had a number of people who have shared that. So um, uh, we appreciate you sharing your concerns because uh, it helps us to know what your experience is like. So uh, let's continue with our worship now. I want you to uh, understand we're starting a new, well, we're in our second of a series of sermon called Lies of Little Gods. And today we're gonna be talking about productivity, about, the, about the, how sometimes we make hard work a God in our lives. So let's listen as we first, we hear the anthem and then we'll hear our scripture read this morning.
Our scripture reading this morning is from the Gospel of Matthew. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a child whom he put among them and said, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever becomes humble like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God of grace, we enter this moment with a sense of expectation. We anticipate a fresh encounter with the Holy Spirit as we gather together. Allow us entry into your presence. Give us a measure of grace and show us mercy, especially undeserved. Today we pray for the ongoing conflict in Israel. We see the escalation of violence, and the list of adversaries seems to expand day by day. Our humble prayer is for peace. Peace in Israel, peace around the world, peace where there is uh, no headline and no publicity and no cause du jour. Lord, we pray for our city as well. We ask for an end to daily conflicts on our streets, that there would be an end to domestic violence that shatters the peace of our families, our neighborhoods, and our city. We simply ask that peace would be more prevalent in our hearts and in our community. Lord God, you welcome us into your presence, I know, and we give thanks for that. We ask that you would allow us to be worthy, to represent Christ Jesus our Lord, that we would share the good news, that we would show people the way, and we would help the world find peace. This we pr pray in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us this prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, <clears throat> but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our hymn of preparation can be found on page 397 in your hymnal, I Need Thee Every Hour. Let's sing the first three verses as we stand. Would you sing with me, please?
seated. Our ushers uh, will come forward as uh, this is our time of offering, <clears throat> but it's important for us to remember that this isn't just about offering our financial gifts to support the work of the church, although that does make a difference and we're so grateful for your, uh, your support. But it is a time in which we think about how we are offering ourselves to God. And I hope uh, that as our choir makes an offering on our behalf, that that will be what's in your mind. Let's continue in worship.
You may be seated. Wow, choir, man, an A game today. Uh, not that you ever are, but that was awesome. That really was. And uh, Victoria Shevkova is our organ scholar, but apparently she plays the piano too. Uh, so that was, that was pretty awesome. Let's pray together. Oh God, open us up. Open our eyes that we might see and our ears that we might hear your word and open our hearts that we might feel. And then, oh God, open our hands that we might serve. Amen. Chris Rock, the comedian, likes to say things to just be controversial, just to annoy people and uh, to get a good rise. And in 2017, he said something that did just that, um, went sort of viral, and that's how I saw it. it. I have not watched his comedy special, but this was par apparently in it. Now, uh, I'm just being the messenger here, so <laughs> don't write me any notes. <laughs> he said, only women, children, and dogs are loved unconditionally. A man is only loved under the condition that he provides something. I once heard my grandmother say, a broke man is like a broke hand, can't do nothing with it. Now here's what's interesting, as I've shared that with others, um, they are offended just like I was. And here's why they're offended. That's not, there is no difference between men and women. They can both have the same demands on them. In fact, women have more, some say, and they all have to produce. They have to produce somewhere. And I think to myself, well, yeah, you're right, but that's not the most offensive thing he said. The most offensive thing to me is that any human being is only of value or loved because of what they can produce. And here's the thing, the reason that didn't bother most people is because that's what our culture tells us, that we need to produce, that we need to be productive, that we need to work hard, that we need to contribute, that we shouldn't be freeloaders, we should, we should carry our, our weight. Uh, so I want us to talk today about this idol of hard work. Um, and we've been talking about how we take things that may be good values, positive values, and make them the most important thing. And that to, to draw most of our attention and most of our energy, most of our time, uh, th that's what, I loved what Colin Bagby said last week when he started this service, this series rather. He said, an idol is when you take a good thing and make it the main thing. So, uh, well, I want us to uh, look at this scripture. What does it mean to say we must be like little children? What does he mean by that when Jesus says that? Does he mean we must be innocent like little children? Does he mean that we must be joyful like little children? Uh, does it mean we should be dependent like little children? Well, uh, if, you, if you look before that, so this begins chapter 18 of Matthew, but, but chapter 17 of Matthew begins with a, 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 another conversation about children. And he, here's what, that, uh, what, is, what it says there. So the Pharisees have come to him and said, should disciples, should your disciples pay the temple tax? And instead of answering them, he, he turns to Simon Peter and, I like, and, and talks to Simon Peter. He has this conversation. He says, what do you think, Simon? From whom do kings of the earth take toll or tribute? From their children or from others? When Peter said, from others, Jesus said to him, then the children are free. They don't have to contribute anything. Because they're the king's children, nothing is expected that they would pay. When he says we must be like little children, what he's saying is there's no way we, little children are, in his culture, useless. They didn't bring anything to the table. They didn't contribute anything. That's how we come into the kingdom of God as people who recognize that we're loved just because 
were his children. Now, I, um, there are always tensions. And as I said, this is when there's a good thing. Hard work is a good thing. And we make it the main thing. So the scripture teaches us that hard work is important. We should be hardworking people. God, in the creation story, God makes the man. He put, uh, puts him in the garden to till it and to keep it. He creates a woman, and he says, I will make a helpmate for you, meaning a partner in your, in your mission, in your contribution. We were made to work, to till the garden and to keep it. There's this passage in, um, in Ephesians. So Paul says this, we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. We should be doing work. We should be accomplishing things for the kingdom. That's a good thing. But sometimes we make it the primary thing when really it's a secondary outgrowth of the main thing. So listen to the verse immediately before it. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. Not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Which God prepared in advance for us to do. Meaning anything you do is God doing it. Not you. You, you can't boast about it. So, yes, we are to be working people, but it is to grow out of this free gift that God has given us. It is this, it is this powerful picture. Not only does Scripture teach us that, but life teaches us that, doesn't it? We, on the one hand, we are, we are to work and be satisfied. That there's this sense of satisfaction we have when we have completed a task when we have done something. I mean, when you mow the grass and it's all done and the edges are all nice and everything's just right and you stand back and you go, yeah, that was good, right? You do something, you accomplish something, you get something done and you think, yeah, that's, that's a good thing. We're satisfied. But on the other hand, well, let me tell you about Joe. Joe, um, I've changed his name and, and details to protect the guilty here. Um, uh, Joe worked most of his life for the same company. He had a, a couple of jobs early on, um, but then he went to work for a company, and he worked hard. And he was proud of being one of the hardest workers there. And he, he was the workhorse, you know? And he, it didn't, he didn't really progress up the ladder a lot, um, and that was okay with him. He just, he just liked the work. And he got up in the morning and worked, got, went early and worked, and stayed late and worked. And, um, and when younger people would come into the business, um, they would be charismatic and, and get promoted, and they would get up ahead of him, and it didn't really bother him. In fact, he was proud of them, and he thought, if my work uh, has helped them advance, then, I'm, then that's wonderful. And then one day, they came to him and said, uh, here is your retirement package. It's time. Um, you know, we, we, we've got to make some decisions, and it's time for you to, uh, to step down. And so he left. And six months later, he was in my office and said, I... I've, I've lost myself. I don't know what I should be doing. Do you have something I can do? Can I do something around here that makes a difference? And I, I thought to myself, his, his whole identity was built into what he was able to accomplish, his, his hard work. That was, his, that was who he thought he was. And so we gave him some things to do to scratch the itch a little bit. But it didn't address the basic problem in that that's what he thought he was. All right, and life, life teaches us that in another way, right? I mean, what is it Shakespeare says? All the world's a stage, the men and women merely players. We have our exits and our entrances. And when we're born, we are completely dependent of no value, no use that's the way I want to say, no use at all. 
All, all, all we can do is be taken care of. And then we go through our lives and at various times we're able to make a real impact and other times, what is it they say in the, uh, Wesley taught us in the Wesley Covenant prayer, let me be employed by thee or laid aside for thee. Right? So various times we can make a difference and other times maybe we aren't really making a big difference around us. And then we get to the end of our lives and, if it, and, and for some of us, for sure, we get to a point where we can't really even take care of ourselves anymore. And someone has to take care of us for it, for, take care of us. And we think to ourselves, oh no, don't let that ever happen to me. Just deliver, I'd rather be run over by a truck, God, than, than have somebody have to take care of me. If, just don't let somebody have to change my diapers, please, God. What does that say about what we, where we think our value is? For we are God's children at both ends of our lives and in the middle. Right there is that, this idol of being able to produce something, to contribute something that we somehow think is the most important thing if we are really gonna matter. Friends, we matter to God, period, full stop. No if we dot, dot, dot. There's no if on the end of that. We matter to God because oh, you guys sang it. I couldn't believe it. We are God's children. Okay, so what is that idol? Here's the shape of the idol. I want to just share what it might look like for you. For some people, the shape of the idol is a list. The list. You have the list. And the list must be paid attention to. The list, it might, like I'm on Outlook, I've read, uh, the list is all red, because it's all overdue, so it's all red. It is all, some of you have a handwritten list, some of you have one on your, on your groceries. On the way out after the 945 service, he told me I could use his name, Jason Connect came and said, throughout the first part of the service, I was doing my list, and he showed it to me on the phone. <laughs> And I said, that'll teach you, won't it? <laughs> that'll teach you, right? Some of you are do, have been doing your list. Look around and see the people around you, right? If, if you, you can't, if what determines whether you had a good day or not is whether you got things checked off the list, then maybe the list has become an idol for you. Uh, at the, at yesterday, Dee and I uh, worked outside most of the day, and at the end of the day, my wife said, we had a pretty productive day. This was a good day. And I was like, we worked all day long. Does that make that a good day? I mean, <laughs> right? We, we just did stuff outside all day long, right? Well, there is that, you, right? If that becomes your definition of a good day, then maybe the list is an idol. If you can't have sit with the people you love and have a conversation without thinking about, oh wait, I've got these things to do. If you can't have, have dinner without, or watch TV at night without checking your phone to see if a work email came in that you're gonna need to deal with, then maybe the list has become an idol. All right, here's a second way it might look for you, ambition. Ambition, to be ambitious. I think ambition is a good thing. I, I'm ambitious, my, my, my children I hope are ambitious. I want them to marry people that are ambitious. Ambition is a good thing. It's wanting to achieve your potential. It's a wanting to, to, uh, to, not, um, uh, to not waste your gifts. That's all a good thing. Then, then Paul writes in, in Philippians, in uh, one of the most uh, powerful um, sections of scripture. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or empty conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to the interests of, uh, not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Don't do anything because you want to get ahead. If, in fact, you feel like um, you need sharper elbows if you're going to make it, then maybe ambition has become an idol for you. 
If it feels like someone stabbed you in the gut because you didn't get the promotion, then maybe ambitions become an idol for you. I know past of pastors, United Methodist pastors, who go to a church, and when they get to the church, they're thinking of how that church might be a stepping stone for another church they could go to. Well, that might happen for them, but if that's their mental picture, then maybe ambition has become an idol. Sometimes it looks like um, self-reliance. The, the idol looks like self-reliance. It's like, don't we love a good bootstrap story? Uh, by, you know, I've walked up hill both ways to school um, in the snow in South Texas and I uh, every, every day and I did this on my own I nobody gave me a break I did this on my own I had to work hard no privilege for me man I was I was the guy who did it on my own isn't it isn't it interesting how we love that story of 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 people who who just did it out of sheer hard work. I heard Will Smith interviewed, you know the actor Will Smith? And he was, he was asked why he thought that um, he was, had become so successful. Here was his answer. The only thing I see that is distinctly different about me is that I'm not afraid to die on a treadmill. I will not be outworked, period. Isn't it? I, I, I just thought to myself, do you know how many actors just work so, so hard and never get where you got? Do you ever think to yourself, did somebody give you a break somewhere, give you that opportunity? Did somebody help you and give you a lift up? No, we don't want anyone to feel a sense of entitlement. Of course we want people to feel like they can work hard. But you are not self-reliant. Uh, I, I like the writings of A.J. Jacobs. He did a book that really lots of people read called The Year of Living Biblically, which was a funny book. It was about, he decided for one year he was going to follow every, every rule in scripture, every single one, what he wore, where he ate, what he ate, where he sat, what he said, all of those things. And it was, it was really just funny because what became clear was you can't follow every rule. It's just not, it just can't be done. And he experienced that, especially in the culture we're in. Well, he has another book that uh, I found really interesting. It's called um, uh, Thanks a Thousand, like Thanks a Million, but it's Thanks a Thousand. And here's what he did. Um, everybody, he has, you got to have a good gimmick to write a book. So his, his deal was he wanted to thank everyone who had a, a contribution to make to his morning cup of coffee. So he said, every, so I, he started with his barista, went and said thank you to his barista. He was going to travel and say thank you to all these people. So he started with his barista and said thank you to the barista. He found out who, who manufactured the coffee cup that his coffee was in. And so he went and said thank you to the manufacturer of the coffee cup. He found out who invented the little plastic lid that has the little bump in it with the hole so you can drink coffee and not burn yourself. And he found out who invented that and went and said, thank you. Thank you so much for inventing the little lid that goes on my coffee. He traveled to the, where they made the, you know, where they grew the coffee beans. And he said, thank you to the workers that were there working in the field and to the guy who, who uh, owned the, the corporation. He uh, looked at the coffee grinders and he looked at the people who make the coffee grinder. I mean, all of those things. If you think about it, how many people contribute to something as simple as your morning cup of coffee? We are not self-reliant. And, and isn't it a wonderful thing if in, instead of thinking, I lifted myself up by my bootstraps, we say, I can't believe how many people helped to lift me up and get me where I am. So we make, a, we make an idol out of that self-reliance. Sometimes we make an idol out of just being, doing good things and, and being good people. That I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna make a difference in the world around me. I'm going to, I'm gonna accomplish things for Jesus. 
And if, if I'm good enough, maybe I'll be worthy of that sacrifice he made for me on the cross. If I can just, if I can just do more. You all, I'm sure, have seen uh, the movie uh, Saving Private Ryan. If you, if you haven't, you might want to close your ears because there's a spoiler here. Um, but uh, Private Ryan is, um, his brothers are all killed, and so they, the, uh, the president decides that he needs to be brought out of battle. And uh, Captain Miller, uh, played by Tom Hanks, is leading the squad uh, sort of reluctantly to go save uh, Private Ryan. And in the midst of it, Captain Miller gets killed. And, and Private Ryan is standing next to him, James Ryan, and he, as he's dying, Captain Miller says, earn this, earn it. And it's this powerful image. And at the end of the movie, um, Private Ryan comes to, to, to Captain Miller's grave and said, I hope I, I, hope I did enough. I, I, I did the best I could, I hope it was enough. Friends, there's nothing we can do to earn what God has already done for us. We don't have to do that because we're approved because we're God's children. So how do we make this, this shift? How do we move to that place where, where it's not about what we can accomplish and how good we can be? I, I, I think for me it's about focusing instead. This is, this is one of my temptations, my idols. So I've tried to focus on being instead of doing. So for example, uh, over the years at various times in my life, I have, as part of a devotional, light, uh, lighted a candle. And I look at the candle and I think, that candle accomplishes what it accomplishes by, doing, by, by being what it is. And that candle is going to, you know, if, if it gets carried into the next room, it's going to light up that room. But all it does is decide, this is what I am. I'm going to be a candle. And we're called on to be that light. And wherever God puts us, we'll be who we are. But we don't have to set out to, to light up more rooms. But who knows where God will take us. Uh, here's a different, another, another opp opportunity. Um, so sometimes my prayer life becomes kind of a task to do, something to check off the list. I don't know if that is true of you. I've got a prayer journal, and that helps. But you still, I've got it done. And then someone said, well, what you needed to do is put, put Jesus, pretend or imagine Jesus in a chair across from you and just have a conversation with him about your life. And so I've tried that, and I talk, but I find myself just talking about all the problems that I need to address, and can you give me help, and how can I fix this, and show me how to do that, and that's really didn't necessarily do it. So a friend told me, he said, try this, the same friend who suggested the other. He said, instead of sitting across from Jesus, sit beside Jesus on the couch and sidle up next to him as a grandchild sidles up to his grandmother and feel his arm around you and just lean into him in love and feel his love for you. Not because of anything you've done or accomplished, but because you're his beloved child and he loves you like a grandmother. Just know that no matter what you do, nothing can make you less loved. For we are God's children. And he loves us. Gracious God, oh, we know you do call us to, to work, to contribute, to give of ourselves. But remind us, God, somehow that that comes second that that grows out of your love for us, that we love only because you first loved us. So God, let us receive that gospel, that good news of your love for us. In the name of Christ, amen. We're going to sing the first two verses of my hope is built on nothing less but Jesus' blood and righteousness. Let's stand as we sing together.
Hear this benediction and choral response. Go bear witness to the love of God in this world so that those to whom love is a stranger will find in you generous friends. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. Amen.